Lord has said, no more thank you. By the way, we're free to go. By the way, get out. Um, they were in a hurry to get out of the country. And it was at that point that it was decreed that there was to be a cumulative payment of the unpaid wages to the Israelites who were due at that time. Um, so there was a great deal of wealth that left with the Israelites as they made the Exodus. And that already with them. The builders of the tabernacle were, of course, Moses, who was inspired by his 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai and his visions that he had there. Also, Bezalel, who was the chief architect, was also the chief builder of the city of the earth, which later on was to become the capital of the Shulman Empire. And then Aholia, I'm trying to say that right, was the chief assistant architect, and uh, by marriage, points out to from the land of Jubilee. The materials that were used, uh, basically, Moses had said he wanted an offering from every man so that he could give in accordance with his, with his means. Everyone was expected to give to the construction of the tabernacle. Um, if you were a herdsman, you were expected to give what you can out of your herd. If you were a merchant, you were expected to give what you could out of your wares. Everyone was expected to contribute. And what you were expected to contribute was the best that you had. <clears throat> you are making a temple to God. You're making a place that you can house relics that have come directly from him. Um, so it was natural that everyone did give the best of what they possessed. Um, this yielded a great quantity of gold, metals, stones, uh, different kinds of woods, and of course, my services that came from the contributors. Moses finally had to turn off the faucet. Um, they had given more than they needed because they asked that they would put what they had. In reading through the descriptions of what was used in the making of the tabernacle, as a student of history, potentially of bachelor's, um, the only thing that I can say in reading through the numerous accounts is that the tabernacle and later on the temple really do represent the pinnacle of ancient commerce. Um, we kind of take for granted everything that you can run down the store and grab from Walmart. Um, you need craftsmen for these things. You need precious materials. Sometimes those materials come from a great distance. Um, there was an awful lot here. For example, just in the colors that were used in the tabernacle. Um, has anyone here ever dyed a piece of cloth? I'm not asking if you dyed it, but you dyed a piece of cloth. If you have, okay. Um, typically what you use is some kind of uh, a vegetable or a fruit. It, it's, it's a vegetable dye of some kind. Dump your stuff and pull it back out. Even if it looks like it's going to be dark, um, when it comes out, it tends to be kind of a pale tan, green, pink, something like that, and it's all said and done. Um, it was difficult to dye something so that it ended up in a dark color, especially a color that was cold. Um, in particular, just from experience, linen is a very difficult fiber to get to hold the color. Um, but what you read in the accounts was that everything was in scarlets and purples and blues. Um, just the description itself, very difficult to either make those or to buy them. Uh, for example, Tyrion refers to the city of Tyr, uh, Phoenicia, which is where Hiram Hiram of Tyr was from. Uh, the Phoenicians found a way that they could make purple dye. I'm sure that everybody probably knows this story. Um, the Murex snail was the only thing that could produce a purple dye. It was a long process, very labor intensive, but it produced a really expensive dye, and that came to be, as we all know, later on the Roman period, why not? That was the color of kings, that was the color of royalty. Um, it was also used a lot earlier. Uh, there was also a very deep blue that was referred to the blue of the sea. And this is mentioned numerous times in these descriptions. Uh, a modern Jewish researcher said that he believes that he has identified the snail that was used for that, and it's called the Chilisin uh, snail. He also says that from what he can see, he thinks that it would take about 8,000 snails to make one millimeter, one cc of this dye. Um, it's actually a gland in the head and it has to be pulled out and stuck into it. Um, it's long, labor intensive, and expensive. But again, that's, there's a great deal of it that shows up here in the tabernacle. The textiles, the linen, the white wool. Let's compare this to when we said how these people earn their living. These are people who wore camel hair and goat hair. They wove their fiber 
was from grass. Um, when you're looking at what was contributed to the temple, you have linen now. You have white wool, not just wool, but the white wool comes off the young machine. It's the softest wool. We'll, go, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the design of, uh, of the tabernacle. But Shittim, Shittim, and Acacia were two of the woods that were used quite a bit in the original tabernacle. Later on in the temple, we'll find that there was cedar and fir that were used. Cedar and fir were more durable woods. Uh, there were also a trade come up that had to come from a distance. So those were important materials. In terms of the stone, I don't think there was a stone that wasn't mentioned in this. If you want to talk about uh, agates and trees and the whole list of, uh, of those precious stones were all in here for one reason or another. Also, oils and spices and incense. Um, once again, the war age, we kind of forget how expensive and how difficult it was to get some of these things. Um, literally, in the ancient world, wars were fought over oils and spices and incense, um, but they were used in absolute abundance here in the tabernacle. The layout of the tabernacle, I think there's a layout of the Um, if, you, if you have a look at the, uh, the green layout here, that was a courtyard. It was a wall of oblong rectangular court, about 200 feet by 100 feet. Of course, the original measurements were in cubits. Um, I just made a rough conversion of the feet. A cubit, by the way, uh, is, is, is a measure from the end of your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. If anybody who's uh, curious about that, I always was. If you go from the bottom of that green section, uh, the ultra earth sacrifice is the first thing that you would see once you enter this courtyard. Um, the ultra earth sacrifice was for reconciling man and his maker. At the time, according to the traditions, I guess you could say, when you made a sacrifice, you burned it after you were done. Um, you either incinerated it, it was sometimes it wasn't altogether burned. There was a burning done. Um, that was just a permanent fixture there for the tabernacle. Once you go past that, there's kind of a little ring there. Uh, this was called the Brains and Labor, and it's kind of a, a cup and saucer assembly, but basically that was for the priests to wash themselves and wash their sacrifices so that everything was absolutely clean and pure for the proceeding with their religious customs. The sanctuary, which is the whole white rectangle there, was covered by a tent. And it was roofed in badger, ram, and goat items. And the rooms were divided. The rooms would be the room would be this right here. Uh, those were divided by wooden columns, and there were tapestries that were hung between them. So there wasn't really walls there, but there were separations. The holy place was about 40 by 20 by 20. When you see the seven branched candlestick there, that was the first thing that you saw walking in. Also, the altar of incense, which would be the gold uh, square. And just to the right of it, there was a table of 12 shubaran, which was 12 cakes of fine flour. I've, I've always thought that represented 12 tribes. I don't know if anyone else says any other little book for that. Uh, the priest entered this holy place every day to remove the candles and to offer more incense. 